G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Explained. In this video we're going to talk about the fundamentals of viscosity. Seems like a really basic concept and you might be wondering why I'm bothering to do an entire video on it, but I personally guarantee that you will learn something by the end of this video, right? So, uh, and if for some reason you don't, then I will refund you the, the cost of this video. So let's uh, talk about it in three levels. I'm going to go through some basic concepts. I'm going to talk about how we discuss uh, viscosity in the realm of lubricants and oils. And we'll also talk about the derivation of some of the uh, key equations. So if I were to ask the question, what are the three most important properties of a lubricant? Obviously, I've kind of given the game away with the title of this video. But number one, it's absolutely viscosity. But number two and three are also viscosity. The reason for that is because 99% of lubrication comes down to viscosity, viscosity changing with temperature, and viscosity changing with pressure. That's really what lubrication is all about. Now, at the fringes, we play with EP additives and anti-wear additives and solid lubricants and all that kind of stuff, but that's for, like, the fringe cases, right? It's for shock-loading applications or, or really high, you know, gear-on-gear -gear action. But, but for the most part we are separating moving surfaces with a lubricant film and the, the depth of that lubricant film is completely dependent on the viscosity. So let's start with some basic definitions. I think it would be pretty uncontroversial to describe viscosity as the thickness of a fluid. Everyone kind of understands this. You know, water is thinner than honey, right? I don't think I'm saying anything controversial there. But we can also extend this definition to say that viscosity is the resistance to flow. So again, I think this is pretty intuitive. Water doesn't resist flow very well, right? So it, it pours easily. But honey resists flow more than water does. Now, when I say resistance to flow, the kind of engineering brain of yours should be a bit switched on saying, oh, I recognize that concept from somewhere. Resistance to flow isn't that back pressure. And you would be right. So back pressure is also resistance to flow. So how does this manifest itself? Let's give, it, let's give a, a really basic example. Let's say I've got a pump, and that pump is a geared pump, right? The most simple of all the pumps, it's a positive displacement pump, so it, it turns, right? Maybe it's connected to an engine, and as it turns, it, it pumps out a volume of lubricant. So what is the pump pressure? Right? Well, the pump pressure, I'm going to give a really easy example of a case where the pump is pumping to atmosphere, right? So it's open-ended, which means that if I put a pressure gauge on the end, it would read atmospheric pressure or effectively zero, right? So the pressure at the gauge that is directly downstream of the pump, that pressure is reading the back pressure in that section of line. So remember, Back pressure is our resistance to flow. Viscosity is also resistance to flow. So if I were to reduce the viscosity of the lubricant being pumped by this system, then the back pressure would be less and the pressure read by the pump gauge would also be less. Right? Now, why is that important? Well, I've seen this in, in a number of scenarios, right? This crops up all the time. So in particular people with truck fleets will often complain that they are seeing uh, a low oil pressure alarm across their entire fleet. And I say, what is going on? And my first question to them every single time is, did you change the lubricant you're using? Because if you went from a 15W40 to, let's say, a more modern 10W40 or a 5W30, then you will see lower pump pressure. Right? because you have reduced the viscosity of your lubricant. And in a diesel engine system, the, the oil pump is usually, well, 99% of the time, it's a geared pump right? that revs with the engine speed. Right? And because it's a positive displacement pump, it's still churning out the same amount of lubricant volume, but it's doing it at a lower pressure. So all you need to do is recalibrate your low oil pressure alarms. All right, so that's... Viscosity and, and its connection to back pressure. 
Now let's talk about viscosity in the realm of lubricants. So you've probably heard a bunch of different naming conventions. Kinematic viscosity, ISO VG, AGMA grade, SAE crankcase, SAE gear, Sabolts. We've talked about SAE crankcase viscosities in the past. Um, but let's put all of these together because really they're all measuring the same thing, but just in different ways. And there are kind of these conversion charts, which will show you how to kind of go between each of them. Now, kinematic viscosity is measured in center stokes. And generally, it's measured at 40 degrees Celsius. So if you're um, looking at um, engine oils or if you're looking at, um, well, in particular, industrial lubricants, they usually take their viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius. It's a little bit confused because sometimes people measure at 100 degrees Celsius. And so the base oil market often talks about uh, viscosity at 100 degrees. So they'll talk about four Centerstoke oils and everyone in the industrial realm will think, oh my goodness, that's, that's so low. But what they're referring to is four Centerstokes at 100 degrees, which converts to about kind of 22 Centerstokes at 40 degrees Celsius. Now the ISO VG rating is, if you look across the page, basically correlates to kinematic viscosity at 40 degrees Celsius. Then you've got the AGMA grades, which are the American Gear Manufacturers Association. Then you've got the engine oils and then the gear oils. And then Sabolts, which are kind of an imperial measurement that we don't really talk about all that much. Now, if you wanted to get a feel for what is the viscosity of some household items, uh, honey will be around 2,000 centistokes at 40 degrees and um, vegetable oil will be around 40 centistokes. So that should give you a bit of a feel for it. Now, this table is a really handy table to have. It's a, it's a really good reference. There's plenty of versions that are available online. So um, if you're watching this on a, on a phone or maybe on a small tablet, it's probably hard to make heads or tails of this. Um, I'd encourage you to go to a version that's on the internet. All right, so let's go back to our definitions and take it a little bit further. So viscosity is the resistance to deformation at a given rate. Or we could also think of it as being the resistance of a fluid to an imposed shear force. So this is kind of the technical definition. Now, how can we kind of get ourselves to the calculation of viscosity? I want you to imagine two plates that are separated by a lubricant film. Now, for simplicity, we're going to keep the bottom plate stationary and we are going to move the top plate to the right. Right? So in order to move it, we have to impose some kind of force and it's going to move at a fixed velocity, right? Um, so it's moving at a specific speed and that means that across the lubricant film, we are going to have in what we call the Z axis, a gradient of fluid speeds. So nearest the top moving plate, the fluid needs to be moving at the same speed as the plate, right? But at the bottom, where the plate is not moving, then the fluid needs to be stationary. So between the two points, you'll get some kind of reduction in fluid velocity as we get closer and closer to the stationary plate. Right, now, we have applied a force to get the top plate to move, but if, it's, if, it's going, if there's no acceleration, so it's moving at a consistent velocity, velocity that means that the force that we have applied is matched by an equal and opposite force, which is the friction force imposed by the viscosity of the fluid. All right, so now that we've got that, what we're gonna say is that viscosity is equal to the ratio between the shear stress, again, that's imposed by the moving plate, divided by the velocity gradient. And that's given by this crazy equation, right? So. <laughs> Um, the viscosity is the term on the left, okay? The imposed shear stress is the force required to move the plate divided by the area of the plate, right? And the denominator is, remember, the, the change in velocity of the, um, of the lubricant, right? Now, that is a derivative, that dv on dz. So if we kind of... Um, Simplify things out, right? This, if you rearrange the equation, looks quite a lot like F equals MA, 
right, which is obviously a, a very famous equation. Um, and that means that the viscosity is kind of the liquid equivalent of mass, right? You can think of it in that same way. All right. Now, to simplify things, let's say that the gradient is c consistent, right, across the lubricant film. That means our dv on dz term just becomes uh, the velocity divided by the depth of the lubricant film. Right. Now, if we consider the units, newtons on metres squared, metres per second divided by metres, and what we eventually get to is pascal seconds. So that is the official SI unit of viscosity. Now, in general, you probably haven't heard pascal seconds used, and that's because in, in reality, no one actually uses it. So instead, we use a unit called um, poise, which is named after a French guy. I think his name is uh, Poisel or something. Now, this viscosity, you might be going poise, but before you were talking about center stokes. So what's the difference between center stokes and center poise? Well, that's the difference between what we call dynamic viscosity and kinematic viscosity. So if you take the dynamic viscosity and you divide it by the density of the liquid, you get kinematic viscosity, which is measured in meters squared per second, right? And that meters squared per second, if we take it to centimeters squared per second, gives us Stokes, right? Now, Stokes is an interesting kind of unit because um, it's actually, um, first of all, we never use Stokes. It's, it's, it's too big a number. So generally, we take millimeters squared per second, and that becomes center Stokes. Now, the interesting thing about Stokes is, um, and this is a bit of trivia for you, there is no singular of it. Because it's named after a guy called George Stokes, right? That was his surname. If you have two center Stokes, there is also one center Stokes. So with an S, that's also the singular. All right, now let's talk about how all these equations relate to measuring viscosity by ball drop method. Okay, so this is probably something that you've seen all over the internet, and at some stage I'll probably do a video on this as well, where you take a column of fluid and you drop a ball from the top to the bottom, and that enables you to measure the viscosity. Well, how, how are we doing that? Okay, when you look at the ball drop method, what it's relying on is a free body diagram, which you've probably done in first year engineering. Right, so when you look at the forces, there is a gravitational force that is pulling it down. Right, There is a buoyancy force, which is acting in the opposite direction. And there's also the viscous forces, which are acting against the motion of the ball. Now, what we are assuming here is that the ball has reached terminal velocity. Right, So it's no longer accelerating. It's moving through the fluid at a constant speed. And so all the forces are in balance. That means that it's pretty easy to calculate all these different forces. The buoyancy force is determined by the displaced volume, so that's dependent on the d density of the oil and the volume of the sphere. The, vis the viscous force is actually given by the Stokes equation, again, named after that same mathematician, George Stokes. And the force of gravity is obviously mass times gravity, right, where the mass of the ball is dependent on the density of the ball and the volume. We can rearrange all of those to give us an equation for the dynamic viscosity. And of course, if we have the dynamic viscosity, then it's very easy for us to calculate the kinematic viscosity. So that's how you would calculate, and I'll probably do this in a future video with an actual example, that's how you would calculate um, the viscosity of a fluid by the ball drop method. All right, so I hope that's been a really good introduction into viscosity, um, how it's calculated, kind of what it means for lubrication. Remember, okay, I'm not quite finished because you've got to remember that there's a couple of really important things. Viscosity is hugely important. This is what I said at the beginning of the video, but viscosity's change with temperature is hugely important for the lubrication of our machines. And the way that viscosity changes with pressure is extremely important for building lubricant films, especially in the elastohydrodynamic regime. Now, the interesting thing about viscosity as it relates to pressure 
is that most of the time, viscosity is independent of pressure. And that's because, for the most part, an oil is an incompressible fluid. But in these really extreme scenarios, like between a, a um, roller bearing and a race, or between two gear teeth, or, between a, a, or at the cam surface, those are extreme scenarios where the, the, the amount of pressure and stress placed on the oil actually does alter the viscosity in a massive way. And that's what most of modern lubrication is built on. All right, so again, um, that was the basics of viscosity. I hope now that you're at the end of this video, you have found that you have learned something. Otherwise, I owe you uh, the precise value of $0 back. Um, if you have questions or comments, as usual, please leave them below. Otherwise, this has been Lubrication Explained.